Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath, Faith Fellowship family that is present and for our family that is watching online. Happy Sabbath to each one of you. We are so glad that we can connect once again this Sabbath as we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth today. Also, happy Memorial Day weekend. I want to take a moment just to to thank all of those of you that have given of yourselves to secure this country and our freedom that so many times we take for granted. And not just those that have been on the front lines, but for the families that have also paid a price along with them. It's, it's a great sacrifice to serve your country. It's a great gift to give, and especially a country that God established for our freedom. And we have this freedom, and may we take advantage of it every day. So for those of you that have served us so well, may God bless you and favor you every day that you have breath, that you would know that you are loved and appreciated. Thank you so much for joining this morning. We continued part two of a six-part series. I'm not sure why it's not seven, but a six-part series um, on the revelation of Jesus Christ. There is no better thing on this planet to be looking at. This is what the entire Bible is about. From the first word in the beginning, as he created, to the end of the story, the entire story is about the revealing of Jesus Christ. And I thank you for the songs you picked out. Christopher, thank you, Cassie and Christopher, for your beautiful worship music that just sets our hearts to be in tune. And yes, Jesus reigns above it all. And I was thinking, pretty soon the curtain we will be pulled back so the entire world will see that he reigns above it all. The whole world's not clued in yet. But very soon, it will be. And today, we are one day closer to that appointed time of the end. There is an appointed day. We you know, we wish that we were there, but God the Father in his perfect wisdom set a day. And we are marching toward that day every day, like it or not. We are marching toward that appointed time of the end. Because after all, people of God, if you are not waiting for Jesus to return, what are you doing? Why are you living why are we drawing breath if it's not for the hope of spending eternity with him? That is the big picture. That is our great hope. That is what we live for. As we, as Christopher said, as we go through each day and steward the things that he's given us, it's not the things of this world that we're captivated by. It's by Jesus that we're captivated by. It is by his word. It is by who he is. He is the one that we are to be consumed with every single day. Very few people pay attention to the last book in the Bible because I've been given several reasons of why it's not the best book because after all, you know, we should spend our life in the Gospels. And of course, the Gospels are wonderful. I mean, you know, we just went through a lot of the the incredible treasure that is in the book of John. And, of course, we're in another book of John now. But it's the revelation of Jesus Christ and all that is in the book of Revelation. Yes, there's a lot of symbolism, I hear. You know, who can really understand that there's just so many symbols? Or it's just so scary. The problem with any of those excuses is that we don't allow the Lord to reveal the whys of this book. Without the whys, yes, why even go there? When you know the whys, everything changes. When you know why God is going to do and act in the way that he's going to act, when you understand the whys, there is a confidence in God that comes that cannot be shaken. It cannot be shaken. And if you want this kind of confidence in your God, in the God that you're professing to serve this day, then you must 
not read. This is not a book that you just read. This is a book that you get a shovel with and you dig because it's a book that requires digging. And those that want to spend the energy and the effort digging, God is going to reveal great and wonderful things about himself so that you will be blown away every time you look in the book. And when we are blown away and astounded by God's beauty, then he grows in our sight, he becomes bigger, and we become less. And that's, that's the story of us. Jesus becomes bigger. There's more of him in me because I'm allowing him to push more of me out of the way. So as we begin uh, the, the study, I'm going to ask us to please stand for the reading of God's word from 2 Samuel 22 today. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom take refuge my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold. He's my refuge, my savior. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. Is this not precious? Brothers and sisters, this is a passage to hide in your heart this season. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful that you have preserved your word for us. Thank you for the privilege that we can read these words back to you because these inspired words are just treasure. They're bread. They feed us. They fill us this morning. They tell of who you are. And no matter how many times we read them, words cannot ever, ever encompass all that you are. So thank you for being so big that we're forever going to be undone by who you are. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to open up our hearts and minds this morning, that we would be pushed out of the way, ourselves would be totally out of the way so that you would be first and foremost without distractions in our, in our minds and that we could absorb what you have to tell us this morning. Thank you for your presence here and thank you for your faithfulness to us this day. For I pray in the mighty name of Jesus and for the sake of his very soon coming kingdom. Amen. You may be seated. Knowing the whys of the revelation of Jesus Christ removes a roadblock called fear. It is something that plagues humanity. If you don't believe me, count how many times God says in the Bible, do not fear, do not be afraid. Even at, at the most miraculous times, God says, do not fear, do not be afraid when he sent angels in their midst because we are a people that can become afraid very quickly and God knows that fear paralyzes. Jesus warns us that a time is coming upon the world that is going to be distressful, filled with tribulation, a time unlike any other in earth's history. Against this backdrop, is the revelation of all that Jesus is. And he is so many things. And this, this series, because I've had the privilege of sharing Revelation story many times, this time it's unique because God once again wants for us to look at who Jesus is, just like we did in the book of John. What Revelation story tells us about this incredible creator God. Part one was about the creator, and we're going to be, if you want to open up your Bibles, we're going we're to be staying in, in Revelation 14, the very beginning, of, for a while, because it's the message, in Revelation 14 is the message that God is going to send out into the world. It's the warning message that goes out, and what God declares about himself through that is so vital to us because it's security. God's word is flawless, we just read. 
as, as God is our security. He's our stronghold. So it's imperative that you and I understand this warning message in the book of Revelation that declares who God is. The second coming of Jesus is not a one-day event. It is a 1,335-day event. It takes that long for God to wind up earth's history. Not just one day. When someone says Jesus could come every day, no, he could not. It's impossible. It would be against God's own word. There are many things that have to happen in order for Jesus to appear in the clouds of heaven. The book of Revelation tells us that there are 14 judgments coming upon the world. Those are going to happen whether you believe it or not. Whether I believe it or not. God's word says it. Whether anyone believes it or not. It's going to come upon us. Our choice is do we want to know ahead of time and ask God to prepare us for these things? Or do we think that we can go in blindly and survive the things that are coming? I tend to be the type that wants to know things ahead of time. I don't much care for surprises. So here we are looking at these things again because it is so important for us to understand what God is telling us about who he is. So if you have your Bibles open to Revelation 14, I saw another angel flying in the midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim again to those who live on the earth, to every nation, every tribe, every language and people. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And so last time I looked at, at from the vantage point of Jesus as the creator, calling the world on the carpet. God reigns, the curtain is pulled back, Jesus is the creator. And amidst this backdrop, amidst the first four trumpets that sound, will be great devastation, unlike anything that has ever occurred. You could put every disaster that has happened on this planet since it started, and it will not equal this. The words of Jesus, it is unequaled and never will be equaled. There are some things that God wants to accomplish through this, and this is in the wise of understanding. Think about this. How many people want to listen to the gospel message today? If you were just to, in, in a shopping center, you know, at, at the grocery store, uh, in, a, in an arena, if you just started, hey, I want to have a Bible study. Who wants to come and find out a, about the second coming of Jesus? How many people would come and swarm around you and want to sit down and give you any attention, any time? And that's just people that may understand that, oh, this is a Bible and this is about God. Anybody that doesn't even understand who God is would have zero interest. And we know the attack that this world is in from Satan. We know that Satan now, in the last few years, is attempting to even change what God has created. Change what God has created. And so we are in bad shape. And so what God's going to do through all this devastation, one of the things is to silence the world. Silence every ridiculous conversation and discussion and problem and situation. The things that everyone's buzzing about and wanting to get on the media about and, and all the victim mentality and all the things that are going on, silence when there is a worldwide earthquake that shakes this world like a snow globe, like you would shake a snow globe, followed by asteroid impacts, by burning hail, and by darkness, the world will be silenced. All of the issues, 
political and otherwise, will be silenced. People will be overwhelmed. Christians will be overwhelmed. They had no clue. People will be traumatized. The Bible tells us that during these first four trumpets, 25% of the inhabitants of this planet will perish. 25% of almost 8 billion people. There's a lot of death that will happen. People will be paralyzed with fear. It will become apparent that God Almighty is acting, that these are not random acts of nature, that this is a divine intervention. And people will be paralyzed with fear because they do not understand the purpose. It is sad to think that our God has to do this to get our attention. All of us. Even those of us reading and studying get distracted with things that we shouldn't be distracted in. And through all of this, how is this to be conveyed? I've been speaking many, many times about knowing your identity knowing who you are, and you can't know who you are with every security that there is if you don't know who God is. When you know who he is, then you accept who he says you are. This is so important because if you cannot convey, if you cannot convey that your God is a God of love, Right now, in times of peace, relative peace for all of us, how are we going to convey it in the midst of the worst devastation that has ever existed? How do you know that your, your God is a God of love? Are you declaring that? Are we people that are declaring by the way that we live and by the way that we speak and by the way that we act that our God is faithful and good and merciful and patient and long-suffering and kind? Are we conveying that? Do you know that without a doubt? Is your identity secure? Do you know that you're going to heaven this day? Do you know with total certainty that your eternal life is secure? Because if you don't, you don't know this. Crucial for us, church. This is crucial that you take God at his word so that you know that when he says all of these things are necessary in order for me to declare my love to this planet, I am going to let this planet know the, bla the backdrop of destruction, that I love them. If you are alive during this time, none of us know we'll be alive and we'll get to see day one. I certainly hope so. But if we are alive during this time, we are going to be needing to convey this message to a very broken people living in a world of disaster. And you're going to have to know this for yourself. And you're going to have to convey how you know that your God is loving, how he is good to you, how he is your personal savior. Because this is what the message is going to be. God's going to be declaring, I love you. I am coming to deal with the last of mankind. I am bringing destruction so that every person can choose if they love me or if they love the world. Because the only ones God can save are those that love him with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And God actually gives that gift if we are just willing to crack the door. It's not that we are capable of loving God with all of our being. When you muster this up, then I'll save you. No, for those, for those that are attracted to truth and holiness, and just crack the door if their hearts open. 
God is going to flood hearts and they're going to accept that God is a God of love and that he is doing what he has to do in order to save the maximum amount of people because God cares for every person in every nation, of every language, of every tribe. He wants to reach every single person with John 3.16. This is John 3.16 lived out. The Father so loved you, he gave me to you. And if you put your faith in me, I'm going to give you eternal life. That's what Jesus will be saying. I want to give you life forever. And I'm asking you to give me your life in exchange. If you give me your life, I will keep it and I will save it. No matter what happens right here, you're going to be with me in eternity when the end of all this is over. It's such an incredible and big story. There are so many pieces going on that it is overwhelming to tell the story, quite frankly. There are so many things that God is doing. There are so many things going on, and that's why I want to look at who God is and what he's doing, what he's revealing about himself so that we maybe get new layers of understanding. Last week, we looked at the first part, fear God and give him glory because God is not feared. And God is not glorified today. And if you didn't get to see part one, I ask you to go back and look at that. Today, we're going to go into the next part. Fear God and give him glory for, yeah, John, excuse me, Revelation 14, the rest of that, verse one, for the hour of judgment has come. Have we contemplated that? God is coming to judge the world and that everyone will be judged? It's a sobering thought. And you and I have great peace because God's mercy covers us so completely. And we know that God says if we are part of his family, that he covers us with his righteousness and we belong to him. And you and I can have assurance today that we are going to go to heaven with the Lord. It doesn't make us irresponsible or unaccountable. We're accountable every single day for how we live these lives. We're accountable for carrying out what God is asking us to do every day. And we are responsible for maintaining a daily relationship with Jesus Christ. When God says, Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. It's every day. Come and receive from me what you need for today. We don't receive today on the Sabbath, one day coming to church, what's going to carry us for the whole week and not have any time with our God during the week. It doesn't work like that. Belonging to God means that we are his, we're submitting to him every single day, and through us, he is able to bear fruit. He is the one who bears fruit because we are under his authority every single day. To think that we come to God one time and we never have to answer to him, go before him, repent, confess, is a very bad place to be. And we will find ourselves in a place of deficiency and of emptiness and of being stagnant and of being totally empty. So being aware that it is our responsibility to stay connected to Christ daily so that, I mean, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't that be the number one thing that we want every day is to maintain a connection, to maintain a relationship, to maintain fellowship with our God. That's what we do. God does everything else. We choose every day to walk with the Spirit, to be be in absolutely absorbing God's presence and not go our own way and live our own path and, and, and live according to the flesh. We live according to the Spirit. Because God says in Revelation chapter 11 that 
judgment, as Peter says as well, judgment begins with God's house. That judgment begins with those that know God. When he says go and measure the inner court, it's go and see whose hearts are pure and genuine. Who really loves me and, or who really just loves being a part of the church? Because there's, there's beauty in that as well. There's fellowship and there's community. And it's, it's a wonderful part to be a part of God's family. But we are a part of God's family because we belong to God. God is first and foremost, love him, then love others. And so this measuring stick goes into the church first. God intends on testing everyone's faith, mine and yours, if we are allowed during that time. And then he will do a most tremendous thing for those who are alive during the tribulation is that he will test us and then he will purify us and give us his nature. I'm going to look more at that in the next week, but it is the thing to look forward to. Okay, there's two places to be during the tribulation, dead or alive. Right? If we're in the middle of some disaster and, and we're killed in the tribulation, well, guess what? We won't go through it. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with not having to live through the worst time in Earth's history. And our, we love the Lord, and he will raise us up on day 1335. If we are alive during that time, then God has to find a way to judge us. That means he can't just look at our life and say, okay, Letty's dead. And so I, I look at her life. Yes, she genuinely loved me. I give her life. Or no, she was just pretending death. If I'm alive, then I have to be judged while I'm still making decisions. And so God tests my faith, and he seals me, and he gives me his very nature. And so that means from that point, because I've, I've shown God I love him more than anything, I am safe for him to put his righteousness within me. And from that point on, I have no desire. No desire. I can't even comprehend that. No desire to sin. I will have no desire for selfishness, for greediness, for self-centeredness, for the lust of my flesh, for distractions to any wicked thing. None of that. It'll all be gone. God does a wonderful thing thing during the tribulation he rocks everyone's world through these judgments but he's giving a tremendous gift as he goes along declaring the gospel as these messages go out everyone is making a choice and those that refuse to love the truth he can do nothing with but those who love the truth oh he can do so much with and he will declare his love and give his righteousness. And that is why I look forward to the great tribulation. I can't wait to see it because it will validate all of God's word when it starts on day one. God's word is validated. But to see God in action and to see the things that we've been studying actually play out. Not, not to say that I won't be afraid of the things I see. Because I've never seen God's wrath poured out. But I won't be fearful for my life or for my spiritual well-being. I will be silenced, I'm sure, like the rest of the world. To, we can read these things, but when they actually play out, they're going to be beyond anything that we can understand. But when we know the whys, oh, God's starting to collect the sheep. God is starting to collect the sheep. He's sending his message out everywhere. Next week, I'll talk about how he sends the message out. But God is sending the message out. He's collecting the sheep. He's working on hearts. We've got to hang in there. And we have, what can I do, Lord? How can I help you? What, what neighbors can I speak to? And of course, right at first during all this destruction, people are going to want to hear what you have to say because most people have no clue. So the fact that you're clued in, what, what, sit down, tell me. Oh, they're going to want for you to tell them. And you have to be ready to tell them, first and foremost, who your God is and who you are in him. 
That is what is going to want to pull people in. I have to tell you about my God and what he's done for me and how he has sustained me. And he loves you. And he has a place for you. And this is what he has done. This is what he is going to do. Let me show you what's coming next. Let me show you the rest of the trumpets that are going to happen. Let me show you the last three trumpets that are actually three woes. Be prepared, be ready. It is going to be an incredible time. And during this time, God is judging. And I, I've been asked so many times, well, how hard will our test be when God tests us? And I, when I'll say, every time, how hard was it not to eat that from that tree at the beginning? Do not eat. You can eat from any tree. Just don't eat from this one. How hard was that test? I love this as a measuring stick because we can all relate to this no matter what our belief system is. Anyone then who knows the good that he ought to do, and God tells us he, he bears down on us, don't do that. That is not okay. Anyone then who knows the good that he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. Are we willing to be obedient to whatever it is that God is calling from us? And God is dealing with us in different ways, but we are being prepared today. Every test is preparation. Every test and trial is to grow our character, to give us spiritual muscle. Every difficult thing that we deal with, all the trouble in our life, God uses these things. We know uh, Romans 8, 28, God works all things for our good because we love him. He can take any situation and use it for our good. So any trouble that we deal with, any difficult times, difficult relationships, things that come upon us, circumstances and situations, we can bank on it that God is going to use it to train us in righteousness, to train us in faithfulness, and to be glorified in it. It's who our God is. So in the great tribulation, God is going to judge because by the time he comes, Matthew 25, when Jesus comes and gathers the people, he will separate them into two groups. And by the time he comes, he knows which are sheep and which are goats. And so he, only he, the Father, judges through Jesus. Jesus is the judge of mankind. He warns us. God never does anything without warning. The trumpets are a warning. In the Old Testament times, the trumpets would sound before the Day of Atonement. When it was time to be right with God or be cast out of the family. And this is the same thing, except this is forever. In, in, the, in the Israelites' time, they, it was a yearly thing, the Day of Atonement. This is the ultimate Day of Atonement, the very last one. And by the time we get to that point, everyone has chosen our choice. Every one of us has chosen if we're going to be sheep or a goat. God doesn't decide for us. We choose our response to the Holy Spirit and to what the Holy Spirit is requiring of us is ultimately where we go. I choose. God says those who love truth will come to him. He will reveal that the light that will come during that time will be like no other light. And the truth will be seen clearly and God says in his word, they refused to refuse us to see something and say, I don't want it. Oh, no, thank you. I don't want this. They refused to love the truth and so be saved. What's the truth? Fear God and give him glory. The hour of judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, and all that is in them. That's a command. Those that love the truth, Lord, I give you my life. I'm yours. Do with me as you see fit. You're my king. I see your love. I know your love. I, I, 
I don't want to exist without you. Yes, I will worship you for all the days of my life. And those that refuse to love the truth, not so much. They will refuse to live under any authority. And like Lucifer, who became Satan, will refuse to live under God's authority. And those that do not join Christ will ultimately be joining Satan. And that is, it's a hard thing to think about. That, that there are only two sides. There is a prince of light and there is a prince of darkness. And the prince of darkness leads the goats. And the prince of light leads the sheep. And the prince of light loves his sheep. The prince of darkness cares nothing about the goats at all. He only cares about himself. And the fact of the matter is we're just pawns for the devil. When we fall prey to his tactics, when we murmur and complain, when we are selfish or greedy or self-centered or harsh, we're, we're allowing him to use us because he will use us in every way that he can where Jesus is trying to change us and remove these things from us because he knows that judgment day is coming. God will weigh in our lives, do we love him and love others. That's the test. And you and I, we don't have to be worried and consumed about a test. When we live with the best teacher on earth, then the teacher has one goal. is He wants for us to learn the course. Forget about the test. Learn what you're being taught. Assimilate it, the ways of holiness, the ways of righteousness, the ways of goodness and love. And when the test comes, it'll just happen. You'll pass the test because you love God already. And you'll say, wow, this was the test? Because you're so consumed with God, you are so in tune with the Spirit that you won't be able to do anything but lay down your life if that's what's called for. In whatever way God asks. Sometimes laying our life is down is laying, laying down bitterness of 10 years. Sometimes it's giving everything that you have for someone else. Sometimes it's making a sacrifice that's going to cost you. Well, any sacrifice is going to cost. And that's what God wants to do. When Jesus says one day to his disciples, one day you will suffer like I did, you and I will suffer during that time. But we will count it blessing to suffer in any way for his great name. So one of the things that God is doing in the great tribulation is judging because he is separating the sheep from the goats. This has to happen before we go home. And so when you look at it, last week we looked at God as creator. He's coming to let the world know, I have created you. I am due respect and worship. I am due glory. Are you willing? And you and I are willing because we live that way. And God will test us to see if we forever want to live that way. And those that don't know will be given an opportunity. How amazing is the Lord. Every people, every nation, every language, every tribe. Why is this happening? Because his message will go to every corner of the world. Because God loves every person. And he will reach every person. And the church today is too consumed with so many things that they're never going to get the gospel all the way around the world. And so God's going to do it in a very unique way that we will look at next week. I want to leave you with this thought. You know 2 Timothy 4, but the verse that comes before this is one I want to tell you first, that we want to look at first. Because what does Paul say first? I have fought the good fight. Yeah, there was effort on his part. I have finished the race. He didn't stop 
running the race, and I have done one, I have kept the faith. We keep the faith by keeping connected to Jesus. We will lose our connection. We can lose our connection. It is our job. Paul says, I kept the faith. Now, now there awaits for me a crown that the righteous judge will give to me, but not just to me. He will give it to everyone who has done what? Has longed for his appearing. Wonderful brothers and sisters, the revelation of Jesus Christ is so many things because God is beyond words. There are certain things that he will declare about himself in the story, of, in Revelation's story, that we need to absorb more. He is our creator God, and he is a righteous judge that you and I can have full confidence and no fear. No fear. You belong to him. He loves you. You are his You stay close to him, and he will provide what you need every day to make it to the finish line. Your job is to stay close. May God bless you today as you contemplate the things that are coming and why they are coming to this planet. God's love is for everyone. Let's pray. Thank you, amazing God for your word that